I want to go a little bit more into the Jamal Bowman defeat because you tweeted a response to Jamal Bowman's defeat at the hands of his APAC challenger, George Latimer. Squad member Jamal Bowman's defeat is a cautionary tale for the left and certainly for socialists about what can happen when leaders break their promises to the working class. Bowman voted to fund the Israeli state's Iron Dome project. With the rest of the squad, he voted to block railroad workers' strike and refuse to fight for the $15 wage or Medicare for All. Working people are fed up with being sold out. We need a party of our own rooted in fighting mass movements. And now, you know, not, not to stir the pot, but Ryan Grimm, who in Donald Trump's America we call a hater. That's what we call Ryan Grimm in this new <laughs> in this new world of ours. Uh, he tweets out uh, a Matt Carp tweet, essentially trying to rebut what you said by pointing out that it was mostly rich people who voted against Jamal Bowman, which is really not a response to what you said, as I understand it. And I'm reminded of something that I heard you say a while ago, and I don't have the video of it, but it made such an impression on me that I don't need the video of it because you said something to the effect of, when you run as a revolutionary, you have to serve as a revolutionary because otherwise your base abandons you. So when they come for you, and they will come for you, yep. your base will not have your back unless you go to bat for them. And in 2021, when they recalled you, you proved your theory correct. When they came for you, the people who put you in office supported you against that recall and fought against that recall and beat back that recall because they knew that you were the real deal. Bowman had no such army in back of him. When Bowman and AOC and Bernie had a rally in the Bronx, Russell went and covered it. Hardly anyone showed up. Hardly anyone showed up. So what is the importance of following? Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, 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 no. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. Finish. You no, say? no, you, you, I, I think you, you get what I'm I, I was, Yeah, I was just <laughs> going to say that, you know, about the rally you mentioned where Russell was, uh, didn't they also have many actually uh, who were protesting against Jamal Bowman's yeah. Inconsistent yep. um, stand on the Israeli war on Gaza, and they were saying uh, they, they had a chant, which I can't remember, but you know, they 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 were chanting against his inconsistent uh, support for the Palestinian people. And I think that is that is the the whole uh, the, the the tweet that you read out really captured what I was trying to say, which is that it is it is a cautionary tale. What happened to Jamal Bowman is a cautionary tale, and a lot of people, uh, a lot of the more democratic party types responded, including Ryan Grimm, who pretends to be on the left, but really is a spokesperson for the democratic party, uh, who had this position, well, you know, but 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 you're totally missing the story. I had a lot of DSA leadership, by the way, tweet, I don't know if Keaton, you saw, the, there was a series of tweets from DSA leaders saying, oh my God, I agree with you, Shama, but not on this one, you've totally got it wrong. You don't, you, looks like you don't even read the news. Do you even know what happened? Stuff like that. And what they were referring to was all the things we just talked about, which is the read restricting, the gerrymandering and the APAC dollars. But none of them mentioned that all of this was happening in the Democratic primary. You know, if you read just the facts about the gerrymandering and the millions of dollars from APAC, you would be forgiven to think for thinking that, oh, maybe it was in the final race, in the general election against the Republican and the Republicans did all this. Well, no, it was the Democratic Party that did all this. And so it was really a lesson for how you can throw a few, uh, even if you throw a few sops towards the working class, towards the anti-war movement, that is not going to be good enough for the Democratic Party establishment. That is not going to be enough for the U.S. imperialist forces who are uh, who without whose blessing this genocidal war would not be possible. And then on the flip side, you mentioned the recall effort against us uh, correctly in 2021, and that's a that's a that's the opposite of a cautionary tale. You know that is like the story of that proves that actually, if you stand up for working people, then that is the only basis on which you can actually win something and then also win re-elections. Like when I left office in December, I left undefeated after having won four elections. And one of those elections was that recall fight. And that was, you know, I, I'm sure you guys remember, but that was set up as, uh, it, it was set up in every way to defeat, take us down, you know, including the state Supreme Court delaying, a very unusually delaying their verdict on whether the recall could go ahead or not. 
uh, in, a, in such a way that it forced the election date to come in the middle of December. I mean, this is Seattle. It is cold, wet, and rainy in December. And you they expected that the turnout would be so small that we would end up losing. Instead, what happened that year is a very interesting story, which I'm sure almost none of your viewers know because it's a local story. That same year, you had Lorena Gonzalez, who's a so-called progressive Democrat, running for mayor. She was on the city council then. She served on the city council while I was there. And then another person who has been a leader of the Black Lives Matter movement, I, I consider them one, to be one of the misleaders, given the actual role they played. And they were hardly one of them. There was too many misleaders, unfortunately, in the BLM movement. Anyway, so you had Lorena Gonzalez run for mayor and Nikita Oliver run for one of the citywide seats for the city council. And they were both fated and celebrated by the so-called progressive, uh, you know, liberal class, you know, all the Democratic Party people, the labor movement leaders, all of them just celebrating them. And all of them uh, almost um, um, unilaterally, they're completely uh, um, shunning our campaign. Not, not one Democrat, not one sitting de Democrat uh, agreed to even formally endorse our fight against the recall. And they were all, I heard from the grapevine, you know, this is palace intrigue stuff, but it's it's a telling one where on in the in city hall, uh, people in my office, community organizers in my office overheard many of the uh, staffers and uh, the Democrats themselves, the city council members apparently saying things like, oh, we can't wait to uh, break out the champagne once she's gone. They, because they all expected that we would be defeated and they all expected Gonzalez and Oliver to win. But instead, what happened, and keep in mind, they had their elections in November on the normal date, and we had our election in December. Instead, what happened was both of them were roundly defeated by their corporate Democrat opponents, and we won against the recall. Again, that shows the contrast of how mm. when you are unambiguously on the side of working people, and, not, and we didn't just stand in principle in front you know on the side of working people no we did we made history we actually won the minimum the 15 dollar minimum wage which is now the nation's highest minimum wage at 20 dollars an hour we won the amazon tax and in fact we won the amazon tax in the midst of the george floyd rebellion when many of the black lives misleaders like nikita oliver actually went around carried out a rumor mill saying tax amazon is not a black issue and we won because we refused to accept their gatekeeping. We went to ordinary black people in the protest movement and they, 30,000 of them signed the petition to go to the ballot, which was the credible threat we needed to uh, win in the city council. So ultimately, unless you have that clarity of you, that you are not beholden to the politicians or the gatekeepers who swirl around them, you are beholden to working people. Unless you have that crystal clear idea you are going to go down or you're going to sell out like aoc yeah i mean it sounds like what you're describing because my question was going to be but you answered it as i knew you would that's why i didn't i didn't bother getting it out was you know what are the challenges of keeping your coalition together amidst onslaught after onslaught and what i hear from that is it's about leadership plain and simple you're a leader bowman was bowman is not a leader aoc is not a leader even bernie sanders not really a leader they are suck ups at the end of the day. They are followers at the end of the day. They're lemmings at the end of the day. You had no machine behind you. You know, you're a, you were a third party city council member. It, it, it's about that clear leadership that rallies people behind you. That seems to be what you're saying. Absolutely. Just to just one point to clarify, you know, you as you said, it's correct. It's leadership uh, and it is it has to be independent leadership, meaning leadership that understands that you, there is no hope of a way forward if you see your role as trying to negotiate some compromises with the Democrats and Republicans. But instead, when, when I say independent, it means leadership that understands that you have to activate the masses. You have to activate working people to fight alongside us and fight for themselves and fight on unified demand. That's how, And you unite people as opposed to allowing the Democrats to do what they do, which is a divisive identity politics based kind of agenda. We rejected that. And especially during Black Lives Matter, we were proven right to reject that agenda of dividing working people along the race lines, but instead uniting them all on an uh, anti-racist and also 
an economic agenda of winning the Amazon tax to build affordable housing because of all people, working people and poor people of all races need it. And in fact, we made the point that disproportionately it will benefit black working and poor people, people because they have borne the worst of the brunt of the rising rents in Seattle as in every other city. But one thing I wanted to add in terms of the leadership is that, no, we did, we did not have the Democratic Party machine in any way. I mean, they were, they were as hostile to us as you can imagine. And if any of your viewers are thinking, well, you did it because it was local and you can't do it in Congress. No, that's nonsense. The Democratic Party will come after you tooth and nail no matter where you try to do that because it's the example of working class fight back that they are hostile to. But I could not have done it alone. So, you know, uh, one of the reasons I co-founded Workers Strike Back, which is a national organization, is because there are other socialists alongside me without whom we could not have done this. And so it was it was leadership, but it wasn't just me. It was collective leadership. Please clap. Yeah.